Dad used to get a tuning fork and he used to, he used to ping it and hold it against his forehead. I'm Richard Durrant and this is the story of my favourite guitar. To understand what makes it so special, you'll have to join me on a journey. We're going to visit the Weald of Kent to meet someone who's dedicated their whole life to preserving England's rarest timber. And then we'll travel to Northumberland to meet a craftsman who decided this unique wood could be used to make a guitar. But to really understand the provenance of bog oak, we need to start in the Fens. This is where the story begins. I'm in Downham Market, Norfolk. The instrument is only seven years old, but it's made from something somewhat older. Very close to where I am today grew a special English oak tree. After the oak fell, it sank into the peat where it lay undisturbed for 5,000 years. Nowadays, East Anglia and the Fens is open and flat. But 7,000 years ago, I'd be wandering through a landscape dominated by giant black oaks. So, how did a giant tree growing here 5,000 years ago end up making music in the 21st century? to visit a wonderful man, Mr. Hamish Lowe, who is the expert in bog oak. At the heart of what I do is, is my guitar, and at the heart of my favourite guitar, my concert guitar, is bog oak. The main structure is, is a 5,000 year old English oak tree. Well, this is definitely the place. Adamson and Lowe, home of the bog oak. Hiya, what's your head? Hello there. I can't believe what I'm seeing. Good to see you, mate. Yeah, oh, blimey. Five thousand years ago, the East Anglian Fenland Basin was very densely forested by gigantic oak trees. Perfect specimen oak trees, much, much larger than the oaks you see growing today. They were perfect, dead straight. I mean, these forests were magnificent, and climate change, rising sea levels, decimated them. They just died standing in water. And then the floodwaters obviously receded and flooded and receded and flooded. So you can imagine when they fell, they, the really big ones would have just smashed and crushed everything in its path and gone splat into this mushy silt of what was once the forest floor and has, and has then eventually been covered over and they've been preserved under what's called anaerobic conditions, so no oxygen. This preservation element has made the timber that's yielded from these trees really, really desirable. So there's some of the tone wood. Oh man, look at that. Yeah. Look these, at that. These are really nice. These are rare. We've had a hell of a lot this year. Why is that? Do you know, I don't know. Is it doing all the dryness and stuff? Because there are loads of things might being be, exposed. Might be, yeah. I honestly don't know. So we can go up there if you like. Now that's, have, a, that's, have a look at them in the round. Yeah, no, they are they are seriously, seriously good. Look at 
The best time, though, is when you actually mill it. And some of them have even got a, you know, a ripple to them. I mean, it is, it's, it's breathtaking, really. It's very, very exciting. And important, you know, they, they, are, they are a national treasure, really, these trees, I think. It's, in my view, for what it's worth, it is the nation's rarest native hardwood because you can't, you simply can't establish plantations of something that's been in the ground for 5,000 years. So it is, it is unique, really, and very beautiful. It does my head in, you know, the spirituality of it. The whole thought of it is just so precious. I'm a cabinet maker and I hail from the Fens originally. And I was aware of this material because you obviously see it lying in the headlands. And, and a friend of mine's father was a vicar in Methwold, which is in the Fens. And he took some photographs. He was a photo photographer and he took some photographs of some, some of these bog oats coming out of the ground. And I said, oh, what's going to happen to them? And he said, well, they'll just be burnt. So I said, oh, I'd actually quite like to try and process those. And by some miracle, the, the first tree that I tried to process was just a superb example. And I managed to dry it fairly successfully. I mean, there were big problems with the planks that I dried, but fundamentally, it gave me a glimpse of what was possible and then I just spent 30 years trying to perfect it. That is beautiful. And it comes with a brass clock key and you can adjust the neck. So he's oiled it, has he? Um, yeah, 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 he's put, a, not much actually. No, no, it's beautiful, beautiful. It's one of the most beautiful things you'll ever see, I think. When a landowner hits it with his plough, and is good enough to phone me, I drop everything and, uh, and feel I have to process it. Sometimes you get extraordinary phone calls. Uh, you know, this is 15 metres long, you know, and it's uh, f over four foot in diameter. And, you, and, yeah, um, and it's really, really exciting. It's like a surfer uh, waiting for the perfect wave. You know, there's, there's sort of buried treasure there so it, you can't help yourself. Hi everyone. <laughs> nice to see you all. So I can't stop talking. It's so exciting to be amongst all the bog oak. I, I wrote a piece of music on this guitar, it's quite a long piece, but I just play a little snippet of it. And when I finished it, I didn't know what to call it until I played it, and then I realised, oh, it's, it's a book of spells. So this is, this is from Book of Spells, because it's very magical holding this thing and thinking what you're holding. So this is from Book of Spells.
goes something like that. Okay, so this is, this is the beast itself. The actual bog oak guitar. And you can hear it's got a tremendous richness and clarity about the sound. And you'd expect something like that from a, from a very, very high-end concert guitar. I think this has got something extra, actually. But the extra thing it has got is, is the story of, of the bog oak. And I certainly feel that when I'm holding it and when I'm playing it. Of course, the whole instrument isn't made of bog oak. The, the front, which is tremendously important, this is, the, this is the soundboard. It's made of spruce, traditionally. This is, a, this is a piece of high altitude spruce. And that's really like the, the moving part of a, of a loudspeaker. It's like the speaker cone. Um, and that has to be held in place by something very rigid and strong and dense. So often a guitar is made of rosewood, uh, sometimes of oak but um, never before of bog oak. Ordinarily, a guitar has three plus three tuners for the six strings, as you can see on this guitar behind me. Um, but this is uh, into the realms of Picasso, I think, a work of art. A, a guitar of this quality is, is, it has to be very, very resonant, so you do feel the thing vibrating. Um, and I can feel the richness of the sound going through into my body, through the back, through the actual bog oak itself. Which is a wonderful feeling, it's usually the low frequencies that you can sense. But yeah, that feels good, that's bog oak vibrating. The story of these first bog oak guitars involves a chance meeting between Hamish the bog oak expert and Gary Southwell, the luthier who lives and works in a tiny village hidden away in the wilds of Northumberland. going back about 10 years ago now, that I needed some bog oak, which I thought just for some decoration bits. And there was a place in Norfolk I used to get it from and they'd closed down and I, I was just searching the internet and found Hamish Lowe. So I rang him up and said, you know, I'm interested in some bits of bog oak. Um, I'm a guitar maker. And he said, I'll oh, come down and we'll sort something out. And so I drove down to see him. And he had cut some bog oak for some guitar backs and sides to show me. And you know, having had a lifetime in guitar making and buying wood and everything, I think it's true to say it was a jaw-dropping moment because I had never seen anything like it in my life. I'd like for you to see it. Yeah, it'd be nice to see it, yeah. New strings yesterday. Wow. We have a bit of a, a bit of TLC. Cut. Yeah. Now it's looking lovely. You're looking after it well, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So the first guitar was very much an experiment. You know, I knew all along it would look fantastic. It's whether the sound quality would be good enough for a serious guitar. And so it was very exciting when you know I finished this and put the strings on and played it for the first time and thought, wow, this, <laughs> this sounds great. <laughs> there's a lot of, not a lot, but there's a few marks down here. 
yeah, you can see just, just kind of wear, wear and tear, Richard, wear and tear. It's, it's a funny thing. Um, you know, it, it's great when people like you, players like you, come in and call in when you're on tour or passing or need, need a bit of polishing or something. <laughs> and um, because, you know, it's great seeing instruments. And I know, you know, some make makers, they, you know, they like to see their instruments pristine and, and everything. I like to see my instruments well used. I like, I like to see marks on them and... To see it without any marks on, you think, oh, they're not really playing that very much. But when but you see... But you're not saying that's not got marks on Well, no, I was going to say... Even gave it a good buffing before... No, I say when, when you see it like day. this, you can see that it's it's being used, you know, which is great. The odd, you know, sort of nail mark here where you've yeah. gone for it. Yeah. <laughs> it produces this wonderful, deep resonance in the sound. Um, but it also has an incredible sustain, more so than probably any other wood I've used. Uh, and so I think those are the two characteristics which, for me, really sell it as a wood to use. With this, say, I like to do an oil finish on, on yeah. the bog oak, so it's not actually varnished, but it will be nice just to kind of feed it with a bit of oil and give it a bit of... Um, what is that? Yeah, yeah. so now this is cedar oil, which I like to use. Bit of sniff, bit of sniff. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's that. The holy workshop smell. It's good stuff, isn't it? Oh. So People who know me well will tell you, you know, I can be quite obsessive during the making process. And the closer it gets to the end of it, the more obsessive I get. And, you know, I want it to be really great. And, yeah, it's a big part of my life. But at the end of that, for me, the, the goal is for it to go out and be played by a guitarist. So I, it's not like I would like to have a stack of <laughs> bog oak guitars in my workshop. The whole purpose is that they're out there making music with guitarists who like to do it. There you go, sir. That is very different. Is it? That is very different. That's... That's what I want. Yes. Oh, You're shooting off the end now. <laughs> oh. oh, that's lovely. Thank you very much. And it smells yeah. smells new again. Yeah, brilliant. God, my little play on this actually. Yeah. Well, yeah. Why don't we uh, Why don't we go and sit down by the river because it's a lovely day, and uh, yeah, well, have oh. a have a drink and a and a play. It sounds that idyllic. Sound the sort of thing that never really happens. But it's impossibly wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Let's go and do that. Yeah. Right, try great. the neck out. Yeah. And, and the rest of the guitar. Yeah, good one. Good, all right. All right. That's quite a, quite a nice spot. Yeah, it's a <laughs> lovely, lovely place to come and relax. Yeah, Not definitely. Bad, is it? <laughs> oh, this neck feels all right. Good. good. Yeah, very good.
periods where I spent more time with this guitar than I have with my family, with my wife, you know, when I take it off to South America to play concerts. And that's an odd feeling because this is the most English guitar you could ever pick up because it's, it's built with a bit of our, our history. You know, the, the time when, when the Fens was, was flooding, the sea levels were rising and all these black oaks died and keeled over and fell into the mud. This is, this is part of the history of our, of our island. Um, so to find yourself standing on stage in Asuncion playing Paraguayan music on this is disorientating. Then you go back to your hotel room and make sense of that. I'd usually get back there and play green sleeves, you know, just to, just to ground myself. <laughs> <laughs> when you, if he's on a, playing a piece of music, and you th look at, listen to that sound, and you think of the expertise that's gone into producing that, you know the musician himself, obviously, the the, the musical instrument maker, who is incredibly skilled, although I don't tell them that. And uh, you know the goon who uh, who, <laughs> who actually pro spent 30 years trying to work out how to process this material. I just think it's I think it's a very good use for it. I feel this great connection with with the sort of history of it and and what it's gone through something certainly Hamish and I have spoken about a lot, the fact that you're then giving voice to this thousands of years old tree, you know, it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's quite incredible really that that should all come together. The Bogot Bure originally um, was for the lute and it appears in Bach's mighty first lute suite in the key of E minor. So the key's the same but everything else has changed and the Bogot Bure really just, just this guitar made me write that arrangement when I first got the instrument. I only played Bach on it for, for about the first month because I wasn't sure where to go with it so I, I went to the purest form of music which is, which is the works of J.S. Bach. And lo and behold, that piece came out in that form. Thank you. 